Diablo 4 arrives on June 6th. As the forces of hell gather, only you can stand in their way. Journey across the expansive open world of Sanctuary. Choose from five powerful classes to fit your playstyle. Adventure with your friends in four-player co-op with cross-play and cross-progression on all platforms. On June 6th, hell welcomes all. Pre-purchase now at Diablo4.Blizzard.com. Rated M for Mature. Tap the banner or visit this episode's page to learn more. This is the Women in Media Podcast. I am your host, Sarah Burke, and uh, my guest today was recently nominated to come on by the wonderful Jennifer Valentine. She is a media personality, an entrepreneur, and so much more. She's going to tell us all about her time at Much Music. Erica M., how are you? I'm great, and I'm so happy to be part of this podcast because I'm all about women supporting women. And you're doing an amazing job of that. So thanks for having me on. Full disclosure, Eric and I have never spoken before. You're hearing the first conversation we're ever having. And I guess like generation wise, I probably watched some of the VJs on Much Music that came right after you. I don't remember watching you on Much Music at the time, but was Much Music where your career basically started, where people would recognize you? Yes, they would recognize me from Much Music, but that isn't where my career started, as you know. All of us have a backstory, the pieces before we got our, you know, call it a big break. So I was working in the music business since I was about 16 years old. So I was an old timer by the time I was <laughs> on air at 23 at Much Music. Okay, what was your first gig at 16? That's crazy. I was working at Shome FM in Montreal. I was the music librarian and I used to share an office with the one and only Rob Braid. My job was to organize all the albums, and I had the coolest job in the world. Did you ever desire to be on air at that time when you were organizing the music library? Hmm. I don't know if I had such lofty dreams. I really wanted to be around the bands to understand the magic. Like, how is it that you, Bono or whoever, have this incredible magic about you that can turn rock and roll into art. I just wanted to be around it and learn about it. So if it required me to be on air, I would do that. But I was, I wanted to be a tastemaker. In fact, I was a tastemaker. So when I turned almost 18, so I'd been working at Shom for about a year, I got a job at Broadway Live in Montreal as a DJ. So I was, at that point, it was really the beginning of my career, truly, because I was in control of the music that was being played. And I liked that position. I liked being the boss. And that was my opportunity to infuse my musical tastes into the audience. And uh, that hooked me. What was the first band or artist that you fell in love with? Oh, it's you too, for sure. Absolutely. I noticed the Bono drop. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was interesting because I recently reconnected with Rob Braid, who was the program director at Shom, And he said to me, I remember, Erica, you were 17 years old and you told me to play the U2 album. And I didn't. And I will never forget that you knew more than me at that time. And so I have like many sort of U2 sightings and conversations and experiences. They're the band that most reflects my my values in life, I guess, uh, because I feel like they are um, genuine and they they have a purpose. They weren't just making music for, you know, just to be cool. They actually were trying to communicate their feelings, their religion. Things they stood for. Yeah. So... That's really me. I am earnest. I really am. I'm kind of a nerd. I really believe that the world could be a happy place, you know, all that kind of stuff. And music (laughs) was the path that I believed could make the world a better place. Okay, so how did you go from Shom in Montreal through to much music? What happened in between? I worked a lot in the music business. So while I was working at Shom, I was DJing in clubs. I was working at A&A Records and Sam the Record Man at the same time. I was managing bands. Whoa! I had a TV show called Muse a Video. You can actually search it on YouTube because a few people have uploaded some of that stuff. So that's 1979. And I 
was hosting a little video show before MTV, really. Oh, yeah. Because someone saw me DJing and they saw how passionate I was and they said, would you do this? And I said, sure. They saw me DJing and then they brought me into this little sterile studio and I would talk about music with one of the DJs from Show FM, Richard Burl. He was the actual host and I was like the nervous sidekick. <laughs> okay. And then I moved to Ottawa and I studied media and I got my degree in communications and then I got a job answering the phones at City TV in Toronto for the new music, which was the penultimate television show, not just in Canada, but really in the world. It was the most progressive music television show in the world. And I got in there answering the phones. And then three years later, after working in a variety of capacities in the building and also as a volunteer at the cable company on camera, I eventually got a job on air on Much. Now, before we go any further, you've mentioned uh, two guys that were sort of part of your early career. Did you feel encouraged by them, empowered by them? How was it? I felt like I was one of the boys. I wasn't a tomboy in the sense that I wouldn't, you know, climb trees or those sort of physical things. But, you know, I kind of dressed a little bit like a guy, like leather pants and T-shirts and boots. And I was kind of tough. It's the 80s at that point anyway, right? Yeah. Yeah. I just wasn't girly. And I still am not girly. Um, And yes, the guys around me, they treated me as a peer. And I was able to live my dreams because they invited me in. They let me do it. I mean, I don't think they could have stopped me because I was like, I was on a path. I just walked in and said, hey, could I do that? Hey, could I do that? It was hard to say no to me. I love that so much. So, I mean, that all sounds very positive. So it doesn't really sound like there's much misogyny in the early years of Erica M. Is that right? There was some. And I'll tell you a story. When I was working at Shom, I was at this point 17 or 18 years old. I had graduated from Marianopolis College. So I went to my boss, who I was working for part-time as a music librarian. And I said, can I work full-time here? And um, he sent me to the head of Shom FM, the general manager, And the guy said, no, I'm sorry, we can't hire you. And I said, why not? And he said, because you're a distraction to the men. Excuse me? (laughs) I'm just letting that, let that sit there for a few seconds. (laughs) He literally said, you, an 18-year-old girl, are a distraction to the adult men who work at Shom FM. I was in shock. I didn't know what to say. I went home and told my mom. She was going to go punch him in the face. And I said, mom you know, it's fine. So anyway, I went off to university, so it was fine. Um, But that was one of the very few times that it was so overtly sexist. What year do you think that would have been? Like around 79. Sounds like a you problem, dude, not a me problem. Well, the problem was easily solved because a year or two later, he was fired. So karma (laughs) always comes back around. Okay, so now you're in Toronto, you got the job, um, city and much. I would imagine there's a little bit of culture shock there. Ottawa and Montreal are very different from Toronto. Did you find that when you first got there? When I was in Ottawa, I didn't really fit in because I was a little bit driven. I worked at the, the local Records on Wheels there. First time that they ever had a girl work at Records on Wheels. Yes, girl. I was one of the boys. It was great. <laughs> well, I went to university and then I moved to Toronto And uh, I fit in because I'd lived in Montreal, which is very, very urban and had lived downtown. And, you know, I was already working in the music business at such a young age. I just, you know, felt at home. Yeah. So when I came to Toronto, they were my people. How did you feel about the competitive nature of the industry at that point when you were just getting your feet wet at Much Music? I felt zero competitiveness. When I went to work at City TV and Much Music, it was a hub of creativity and inclusiveness. It was an incredible place to work. It was all about innovation. They worked on a shoestring, and all of the innovation came from the manpower, from the the young people who they brought in to create content, tell stories, um, spread the word. It was a really exciting time, and... There was honestly no competitiveness. The person who would be sort of the closest competition to me would have been my mentor, Janie Becker. 
I was her assistant in the office and she was the queen and I would never ever even consider replacing her, being better than her. And you were there to learn. Oh yeah. And she was a real trailblazer. She's the one who took all the shit for being, you know, a strong woman in a man's world. So she kind of paved the way for me. It wasn't as shocking to have a girl in front of a camera interviewing bands because Jeannie did it on the new music. I just watched her. Our desks were beside each other. Actually, J.D. Roberts was my my hands-on mentor. He was the one who would sit down with me and he would go over tapes. And he was the one who really taught me the ropes and gave me the confidence to, you know, to do bigger things. JD was the one who helped me. What do you think you brought to much music that maybe was a little different than the people before you? Jeannie and I were similar, but she really wasn't on much music. She was on the new music. She went on much music a little bit doing what we called rock news at the time. (laughs) But that was just a very part-time thing for her. It wasn't sort of her main focus. There weren't a lot of people like me. I walk to my own beat. I do my own thing. I do what I love. And there weren't that many young women who had such a rich uh, resume at such a young age. I love to work. I just love it. It's, you know, that old adage, you know, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. I I didn't work 24 hours a day, but I worked 24 hours a day. That's all (laughs) I wanted to do. It was my social life. It was my creative outlet. It was how I made a living. It defined me. All these years later, looking back and reflecting, you were part of launch, obviously, then. I worked in the office when it launched. I was behind the scenes. And then I think it was probably 10 months after they went live is when I went on live okay. on much. It's um, pretty much launched. Well, very no, new because I, I was able to watch how JD and Christopher Ward and Michael Williams invented what they did. We invented something. It was very different than MTV back in the day because we were live with no script. No teleprompter either, No right? teleprompter. There's nothing to prompt. It was all out of our heads. And <laughs> there, was, there was a floor director, but there was really no director. We just did our own thing. We did our own research. We planned what we were going to talk about. And then the crew just helped us um, do it. And sometimes they say, oh, we, you know, you've got to do this piece or that piece. And so I would, you know, have to do a voiceover or something. But ultimately, the content was up to each individual on-air person. They hired real people. That sounds like a dream, right? Because so much of the content you see now is decided by a sponsor or, you know, a program director or a music, right? So that's Well, okay, let me clarify. I didn't pick the videos. So we had music team. I forget. I don't remember what it was called. Um, but there were like eight people who were part of the day-to-day operation who would go into a weekly meeting with stacks of videos, and then they would do a playlist, much like a radio playlist, um, heavy, medium, and light rotation. And so my shows were put together for me. So the night before my show or the day before, I would get a printout of the videos that would be played. And the person who was programming those shows, which is one of the associate producers, would program it knowing the music that I liked. So I would say 80% was medium, heavy, and light rotation, and 20% will throw you some bones, Erica, stuff that you specifically like. So it kind of had my vibe. My job was to make, make the talk. How does it all tie together? What do you want to say about what each What do I video? want to say? What are the stories? How do I make it personal? How do I make it relevant to people at home? So it was, it it was storytelling. It's great. Communicating. So interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, because a lot of people even still now think that, you know, someone on the air on a radio station is picking everything that they're talking about. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, like, it's never really been like that since the 70s. So (laughs) it was big business, right? Because we were making and breaking artists career. So they had to have some sort of a format to do it properly and professionally. 
But the professionalism ended there. Okay, so this is a two-parter question. First, tell me about, you know, a let's call it a trend that you started, taste making at Much Music. There were so many of them. Um, I started a show called Fashion Notes. It was before fashion television because we were encouraged to start our own shows. So aside from the regular introducing videos that you have seen with other VJs, I did a, like a three minute interstitial show where I interviewed up and coming designers. So like streetwear across the country and interviewed the designers and had people model them. And I wore a lot That's of so cool. really cool streetwear. Like I have kind of boring hair. So I, and I really don't like fussing with my hair. So I started wearing a lot of hats. Then I decided to produce a collection of Erica M. hats. So I did that for three seasons and I had, I used to wear them all the time. So I think I made wearing hats cool for a short period of time. (laughs) That's so fun. Okay. The second part of the question, tell me a risk you remember taking something that you didn't know how like the, the team would receive, but that you wanted to do on air. Honestly, every day was a risk. (laughs) It was because, imagine this, I was live four hours a day with no script. And oftentimes we were out on the street. It was live. It was- You can't like Google something. You're like just standing there. Yeah. I was researched. So I knew some of what I would talk about, but we were literally on Queen Street and people would walk by and talk to me or I would talk to them. It was live in the truest sense. And, you know, shit happened. We never knew what was really going to happen, which is what made it very exciting for the viewers and for us. Every day was different. So there was a risk every day of something going off the rails. And it's almost like um, when you're in Second City, you know, you could take class in Second City and it teaches you to roll with everything. It's like, You can't say no to anything that comes your way. You have to say yes and. Yes. And and I feel like I learned that doing live television because things would happen around us all the time and you wouldn't block it out. You'd acknowledge it. And so let's go and do A, B, or C. It was a, a really useful skill. Oh, yeah. Because now and for the last 30 years, no matter where I am, if I'm on stage and something goes wrong, it's okay. I can go with it. I know how to go yes and. So when I do keynotes, for example, I'm very confident on a stage because I know that if something messes up, if the, the mic stops working or if I forget what I'm going to say, I know how to roll with it and get back to where I want to be. Okay. What about like a content risk? Like maybe something you wanted to put in the spotlight, maybe about an artist. So you're asking me to remember what I talked about 35 years ago. That's going to (laughs) be really hard for me to do. I can tell you that I ask pretty provocative questions to artists. So I'm very well known for a lot of different interviews. Probably the biggest would be my Kurt Cobain interview. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't know that that would be my defining moment in terms of the World Wide Web which there wasn't when I was on air, there was no internet, but I had no idea that that would be the interview that defined me. But I chose to do things very differently in that interview, which I think is why it stands a test of time, but it was risky. Well, first of all, he walked into the room to do the interview and I very consciously talked to him like I was a person, not a mainstream media person. So when he walked in, I said, Hey, do you want to do the interview in the bed or on the balcony outside? And he went, uh, outside. It kind of shocked him because (laughs) of course he doesn't want to do it in the bed. But I wanted to ask him because it made him look at me like, who is this weird person? Right, right. And then when we started chatting outside, I asked him a lot of unusual questions. The first question, again, strategically was, uh, what are you reading? And what's your favorite book? Yeah. And I just revisited that interview like two weeks ago when we got connected through email. Right away, like I had a different impression of that interview, thinking specifically about like you and your career than I did the first time I heard it whenever I first Googled it, right? Which would have been probably 15 years ago. What was different this time? I think 
knowing more about you, because the first time I would have listened to that interview, I didn't know it was you interviewing. Okay. Right. Because you're kind of like anonymous a little bit in what's been shared on the internet. Right. But I was like, wow, she's asking him about books. You're finding a trust with him before you talk about the fame. Bingo. Bingo. Yeah. It was so interesting. I wanted him to see me as a person and to be able to talk about things that are important to him that he doesn't usually get asked about because he was on a junket, as you probably know what a junket is. It's like you go from room to room and get asked the same question by the same morons, like of which I was one. Um, (laughs) And I wanted to do something that allowed his brain to work in a different way, you know, to light him up and for him to have some fun. And it worked. And you know what? There were a few times in the interview too where you said, you know, I don't really know about this stuff either. Like you were really real about like your own reservations about mainstream media as well, which I think made him feel even more comfortable. I did not speak like a professional on purpose. Now, I will tell you that was strategic and no one was supposed to hear that interview in its entirety. The way things used to be, Sarah, was you go and do an interview and you have a camera over the host's shoulder shooting the guest. Then after the interview, my cameraman and I fake it. We do what's called re-asks. And so I re-ask the questions that I ask, but I can ask them in a somewhat elevated way. Right. A little less casual. And then in editing, you glue it together question and answer. So it looks like I'm asking him the questions. But somebody stole the raw tape of the Kurt Cobain interview, which no one ever shows. Even the cameramen are horrified because if you watch the interview, you'll see that there are times when the camera kind of lingers down to his hands or goes over his shoulder to get a cutaway of the um, Seattle silhouette, because he knows that that's a cutaway. So the way we record them and, and do an interview is done with the knowledge that it will be edited. Right. So what everybody has seen is the unedited version, which is why you don't see me, because the camera right. is over my shoulder. And I was horrified, to be honest, because I spoke in a very colloquial way and was kind of goofy with him to relax him. Yes. But that yeah. was not my, that's not the way that I wanted to be perceived. <laughs> so I guess it worked. Ultimately, uh, it worked out, but the edited version is different. And is the edited version anywhere? Like, how did you guys get the tape? I'm sure it's for sure somewhere in the Much Music Library. Actually, there's a Much Music documentary that's coming out well, you know I'm going to ask you about yeah, that. Yeah, so we could talk about that, but okay. there is a clip of it where I'm goddamn in the shot. <laughs> so that was nice. Did you learn anything from him that you took into your interviews moving forward after him? I learned that my approach was effective in interviewing, so that was most important to me because... Mm-hmm. I wasn't that into his music, to be honest. I wasn't a huge fan. I didn't Mm -hmm. dislike it, but it didn't speak to me the same way as, for example, you two did at the time. Right. It was, I was, that was more of my vibe, you know, but you have to, as a professional, you have to love them in the moment. Of course. And understand what makes them beautiful and what Mm -hmm. makes them interesting and compelling and get that story and get them to tell that story because It's not up to me to say they're good or bad. It's up to me to say, here it is. Here they are. Here's their story. So I think what I learned from it was, first of all, he is um, very, very sensitive, for sure. Yes. And, you know, he was sort of a real bastard when he was interviewed, you know, one or two words in in an answer because he's tired of being interviewed. He may as well have been a hockey player. (laughs) Well, I don't think he liked fame. He felt very uncomfortable with, you know, the facade of fame and the game of fame. And, you know, when I talked to him, I I did the opposite. I talked to him like a human being and he very much appreciated that. So what do we learn about that? I think famous people don't like to be treated like famous people. I think famous people really appreciate when you talk to them 
Like a human. Like they're a normal human being. What was your favorite interview ever during your time at Munch? <laughs> That's 10 years of interviews. Um, well, I would say one moment that I had that was memorable was Sting. I interviewed him backstage at the Sky Dome before one of his concerts. And, you know, he's just a very bright guy and eloquent. So I felt like we were having a lovely conversation. And then at the end of the interview, he says to me, you're very beautiful. And I turned around to my cameraman. I said, did you get that? And he's like, nah, I turned off the camera. (laughs) (laughs) So that's what I remember. But there has been a lot of really memorable, in excess, crowded house, Chrissy Hind. Dwight Yoakam, Otmar Liebert, Wasp. What about you too? I never interviewed them. Thanks for asking. Uh, well, we got to make that happen somehow. <laughs> Seriously, it bothers me. Well, let's go there. I mean, the, mm-hmm. the documentary is um, a big conversation right now. And I think all the much music nerds who grew up watching much music cannot wait for this to be available. Like, Yeah, that's 92% of, of Canadians, you know. Right? Like what? Mm-hmm. So tell me about... You know, the beginning conversations about the documentary and your mm-hmm. involvement and maybe something that we should be very excited to learn that we might not know. Well, when they first, uh, someone emailed me and said, we'd like to interview you for a show about Canadian television. I was like, I don't like to do interviews. I'm tired of doing interviews. I'm doing this interview with you, Sarah, because you're friends with my girlfriend, Darlene, and because Jen Valentine introduced us and also because you specifically are interviewing women. Thank you. And that's super important to me. And also because you're a woman. So all those things. But a lot of people want to interview about much music. And I mean, give me a fucking break. Sorry, man. You're it's like 35. You're so tired of talking I'm about it. I'm sick of it. Like, with respect. Yeah. So I get this email saying, you know, would you do this? Uh, we want to interview about Canadian television. I'm like... I replied like, dude, what exactly do you want? Why are you interviewing me? What is the focus of this interview? And I get a phone call and it was this guy, Sean Menard, who said, actually, I'm the director slash producer. And what we're really doing is a documentary about much music. And I was like, okay, tell me about it. Well, he started to talk and he is an amazing guy. He is thoughtful, innovative, strong point of view, understated, modest. He listens really well. So after we chatted for about an hour, I said to him, Sean, not only will I be in your goddamn documentary, but if you'd like any help, I'd like to help you because I think you're the person to do it. And so he said, would you be my consulting producer? And I was like, I would be honored. So I wasn't that involved because I have a podcast called Reinvention of the VJ. I have done one hour to two hour interviews with 20 of the on-air people. There's still more to do, but I really got to know all these people, some of whom I was on air with and many of whom I'd never met. And also I reconnected with a lot of people that I used to work, but we're not in touch the same way. And so I was able to tell him who are great storytellers, who are great interviews, and so that's, that was my contribution as well as being interviewed. I've seen the documentary uh, once now, and it is very moving, I think, because it's not just a series of interviews. In fact, you never see any of us, our faces, the way we look today. It's all archival footage with our interviews overlaid to give it perspective, to share a bit of the story of what was happening at that time or how we felt, how much music was born and really how it died. And how it contributed to culture in such a crazy way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Sean Menard is going to do a Canadian premiere at Rory Thompson Hall on, I believe it's September 22nd. And if you want to watch the trailer and all of that, links for you in the episode notes. So did you go to um, South by Southwest? I didn't. It's too expensive. No, okay. Yeah, that's and you fair. know, the thing is, Sean Menard literally mortgaged his home in order to pay for this. Oh my God. He believes, believed in it so strongly. And he is the first person that Bell Media has allowed to go into the archives and actually use the footage. Wow. So it's a, it's a very special thing. And my understanding is now Bell Media is now digitizing the library. 
which is falling into disrepair because a lot of it is, it's tape, it's disintegrating. So they've right. started to digitize it, which is fantastic. And then we'll get to see some of those other Erica M. interviews, hopefully. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I look forward to that. So now you do a lot of keynote speaking. Tell me about what you're doing now. Basically, I think what I do is I turn my passion into my business. 22 years ago, I had my son and my daughter 19 years ago. Holy crap. That happened quickly. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and in the process... I started a website called yummymummyclub.ca. So I started it because I wanted to connect with other moms. I also had a TV show called Yummy Mummy Club. And it was on uh, Life, the Life Network and Discovery Health, and it was broadcast around the world, etc. And when that show was over, because I wrote it, and I co-produced it, and I was obviously the host and everything. When the show was over, I was like, I need to connect with more moms because I, I was kind of on a mission I felt like at that time, women were still spoken to like they were less than, especially moms. Moms were invisible. Moms didn't have the voice that they have today with social media. That was the best thing to happen with motherhood. So I started my little website and it was a place where women can have a a strong voice and a safe place to share the ups and downs of motherhood. And then what happened was all these brands discovered us And they started to knock on my door and say, like, we'll give you a free broom if you write about our new broom. And I said, dude, that doesn't pay the rent. So I started an an agency called Co, which is a, a content marketing agency working with moms and their families doing sponsored programs. This was way before there was something called influencer marketing. I was going to say. mm -hmm, We had the, uh, the YMC network. We had 500 moms who were on our network and we would do sponsored programs and then we would send it out. Who wants to work on this program and why? It had to be authentic and real. And um, we, I built that business to about a million and a half. I had about 50 people working for me and it was, it was more than a business and it was more than a website. It was a way of life. It was a community. And uh, I think it affected a lot of people's lives and gave a lot of people careers which is, uh, which is pretty great. And I sold that uh, last year to the people who own Toys R Us. Amazing. So I still work for them on a part-time basis to keep YMC vibrant and alive. And, uh, and yes, I do a lot of keynote speaking and I do a lot of, I just like to create stuff. I like to make stuff. I like to collaborate with people and do cool shit. At the intersectionality of all those things is storytelling, though. Same as what you would have said about much music, right? Absolutely. That's that's my, I guess, superpower. It's storytelling with an eye to connecting. I need to connect. Authenticity. I have to. And uh, the person that I was on much music, I'm the same person today, just a, you know, slightly older. But my values are the same, and my deep need to connect. So now, most recently, Josh Matlow is running for mayor of Toronto, and he's been my city councillor for 12 years. I'm all in. I'll go on any radio show and talk about him. I'm literally canvassing in half an hour after this conversation. I'm knocking on doors in all parts of the city because I want to use my voice to make good things happen in the world. Well, your voice is so important, and it is authentic, which is why... You know, you had so much success then and with your business. Congratulations on the sale last year. That sounds incredible. Well, it was a relief because yeah. I, I had done it for a long time. And, you know, what happens is when you're a mom, at a certain point, you no longer put yourself as a mom first. Motherhood sort of becomes secondary when you, I don't know, your kids become like 10 years old. And when you're in the teen thing, that's like a whole other sort of... <laughs> <laughs> Should we invite my mother into the chat? Oh, God. So um, I was feeling less connected. And for me, it's really important to do things that I'm passionate about. So my passion for motherhood waned. Not for business, not for connecting, not for community, not for innovation. All of those things are what light me up, but the motherhood piece, less so. So that's why I'm only doing it part-time. 
That's fair. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what about the podcast? Are you still doing the podcast? I put it on hold, but I may go back to it just because there's so many stories to be told. And I think people really, <laughs> really enjoy it. And my favorite thing really is interviewing. So I'm kind of jealous of you that you get to interview me because I'd like to interview me because I like <laughs> doing, I like, <laughs> I like doing interviews. There's a guy, um, on the, he, he has a podcast called I think it's called Awards Chatter. His name is okay. Scott Feinberg. He is one of the top people at Hollywood Reporter. And he does a weekly hour-long interview with celebrities or people who are in the film industry. I'm obsessed with him. Not his guests. I'm obsessed with his ability to elicit such amazing interviews. So I listen to him and I listen to the skill that he sort of takes his guests on a journey and the way that the guests voices start out are completely different at the end because what he does is kind of what I did with the strategy. Yeah. It's, (laughs) it's brilliant. So yeah, I would like to do more interviewing. Um, So if you can manifest that for me, that would be fantastic. Guest interview. If I need to take a vacation and I can just put you in here. (laughs) Set me up. Put me in coach. One funny thing here. So yes, Jen Valentine nominated you to come on the podcast, which was great. But before that, at the gym, I go to an F45 here in uh, the West End of Toronto. And your friend Darlene, you mentioned earlier, she's like, oh, Sarah, I've been checking out your podcast. Like you have to interview my friend. I go, who's your friend, right? (laughs) I have no idea who she's going to say. She says Erica M. And like, You could tell I had a lot of questions for you because I didn't grow up watching you um, that maybe someone in a different generation might have known all those things about you. I didn't. But I knew your name right away. Right. Like you're a fixture. So going back to Spotlight here, I guess the question is, how did Spotlight over the years affect your personal life, boundaries, um, how you keep things separate with your family and all of that? I'm so happy you asked that question. First of all, I'm a Canadian celebrity. So right away, ratchet it way down. It's like, (laughs) there isn't really such a thing. Okay, so that's number one. Generally speaking, I'm kind of a, I'm I'm kind of an introvert. And I'm kind of shy. And I don't like, like bars and stuff. My least favorite thing is drunk people in a bar coming up to me. Oh, Kim, I grew up with you. Like, get me out of here. That's like kind of my nightmare. But in terms of people reaching out and saying, oh my God, I grew up with you on Instagram, for example, I get these amazing private messages where people tell a little story about you came to my school or you helped me here or you played my one of my requests on Much Music or you inspired me to do something or other. I love being in a position of... I guess being a role model, because I think I'm a good one. You know what I mean? So I think it's good that I'm in the public eye as opposed to other people who may not be as um, positive for mostly women to follow, but also for men, because I feel like I'm super feminist. I'm super don't fuck with me. This is who I am. You know, if you don't like it, see ya. Yeah. And I think it's important that there are that I have that ace in the hole of people used to listen to me and they liked me back in the day. So perhaps they respect that way of thinking a little bit. And, um, you know, I'm like, I'm the older person in the room now. And Your hair looks the exact same. (laughs) It's not. um, But there's there's a gravitas that comes with it, which I like. I like being in the position to influence people to be better and to treat people well, etc. And by the way, the mention of my hair, I'd like to say, um, and I don't know if that was you in the setup, but before I did the interview, I go into your podcast software, and it says, fix your hair, and it, it's crossed out, and it says, fix your mic or your camera. Yeah. And yeah. I, do you, did you do that? No, it's Riverside. It's a default. Oh. So the platform we're using to record. I love it. Because our obsession... <laughs> with hair and how our hair looks, it just disgusts me so much. 
gives a shit what my hair looks like. Do you know what I mean? I do, especially today because I was working on producing an episode of a podcast that comes out an hour after this recording is done. So I was trying to get ahead of it. I look up at the clock and it's like 2.52. We're recording at three. I was like, well, this is what the hair is today, you know? And I love though that as soon as I was in the digital recording space with you, I'm like, hair is the least of my worries. I'm having a great conversation with someone. This is good. I just feel that there is this weird obsession with how we look, which has nothing to do with who we are. Yeah. And especially women are under so much scrutiny by, I don't even know who. Is it other women who are scrutinizing us? I don't know who it is. Everyone, yeah. Other women, men. But it's like we're spending money, this younger generation who are in their 20s and early 30s, who are spending thousands of dollars on Botox, like in their 20s, preventative, they're saying. It's a scam. They're getting scammed. You need people like me who are older saying, you don't have to do it. People will like you anyway. You'll be okay. Save your money. Go on a trip. Don't spend it on things like Botox. Now, listen, I'm not judging someone for doing it. My comment is more based on why does our society make people feel like they need to do that kind of stuff? You know what I mean? So anyway, I'm just... Just a little tangent. I love it. Yeah, I can tangent and I can rant about this, (laughs) especially because this is a um, this is a podcast about women in the media, and it's just it has nothing to do with your storytelling. Exactly, bringing it back, right? Exactly. Okay, so the last segment of this podcast is always um, nomination. So where Jen Valentine said your name. Um, I just want to hear the names of a few people that you would nominate to come on the Women in Media podcast and share their stories. Well, we mentioned Jeannie Becker. So she is an extraordinary woman and continues to be even more extraordinary as she progresses through her life. Um, Jen Hollett is an amazingly interesting woman. She was on Much Music. I didn't really know her when she was at Much and we connected way after and she runs the walrus right now she's one of the the editors there and she does a lot of speaking she has a very strong voice she ran for office she didn't make it too bad because she is the kind of person that we need yeah super bright i think she went to harvard she's a really fascinating person and then i have a friend she's not really in the media but she does a lot of media her name is christine chambers And she is the chief science officer at CIHR, which is the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. We need more media from that field. Her role is she leads the decision making in how the government money for health research is spent as it relates to children and families. There are 13 institutes in the CIHR. She runs one of them. And she's just an amazing storyteller and very passionate. And uh, I just have so much respect for her. And Darlene, that y- who you mentioned, you know that she is a killer, right? Darlene? Oh, yeah. She's a boss babe. But do you know what her specialty is about literacy in disadvantaged children? And she speaks around the world. She's incredible. Mm-hmm. I, I've only known a little bit. Yeah, she's very modest. She doesn't really speak about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but she is an extraordinary woman and very passionate. And if I can get her to not be embarrassed, then maybe she would do the podcast. We'll see. Oh, she, she won't be embarrassed. <laughs> Are you kidding? I had her and her son do a Facebook Live for me. Max Parker. Yeah, because I, I also run a not-for-profit called the Inside Out Initiative. And they're sort of spokespeople for it. It's all about inspiring teens to um, to be motivated intrinsically as opposed to parents telling them what to do. And the two of them did this hour-long conversation without me. I need to watch it. They're incredible. They're really special. Do you know how I met Darlene? No. I met her at the running room. <laughs> I met her at the running room 25 years ago. We both were doing, uh, we were both training for a half marathon. And we started to run together. 
and we became really good friends. So it's funny how we both met Darlene through fitness. That is so funny. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Did you know that I met her from the gym? Yes, she told me. Okay, that's hilarious. Mm -hmm. Erica, I know that you don't do interviews, so I'm so grateful that you said yes. And thank you to, you know, Darlene and Jen for sort of helping with the cause. But it's been amazing talking to you and, you know, all the things that you've taken from your experience in television and put into this this other realm, I am just inspired. Oh, that's so good. Well, I, I'm always happy to hear that uh, women are inspired when they hang out with me because that's that lights <laughs> me up. Thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. And don't forget, if you need another host. Oh, yeah. It's tapping <laughs> you in. It's you in. Hey listeners, I'm Christy. And I'm Melissa. And this is Buried Motives, where we dig deep into the details of some of the most gruesome dirtbag murderers. She said she enjoyed hurting things that can't fight back. And that is a disturbing view into the mind of a murderer in such a dirtbag. Yeah, that's not even strong enough words. This is totally a recipe for disaster. And not to justify whatever is going to happen, but you can totally understand and see how this would be in the works. If you were only to look at what she did later on and not know any of that history, she would appear like off the wall crazy. Oh, 100%. Because we're not even close to getting to the end yet. But you can just see this pattern and all this kind of stuff developing in her, which is what we're here for. We're digging deep. Join us each Thursday as we unearth the dirt bags that live among us and the motives buried there. Hope you join us as we exhume the truth. Another Sound Off Media Company podcast.